That is Wendy Gambolis. She is the girlfriend of the victim, uh, Knight. Remember, this is the case out of Florida. Knight was stabbed six times by the driver in front of him. There's inconsistent stories on whether or not this is a self-defense case or not. Uh, right now, we're watching in the courtroom live for you, and it appears that they are on a sidebar, although I'm looking at the screen right now, and I'm not sure. It looks like, okay, they're still in a sidebar already. So, um, all right, so with me is Alora Nano. She's a long crime trial analyst. And uh, Laura, I wanted to discuss this case with you a little bit and dissect what we're hearing and whether or not um, you think that there's a valid self-defense argument to be made, even though the judge decided not to dismiss the case for self-defense. Well, well, Carissa, I mean, here's the thing. Um, the fact that the judge would not outright dismiss the charges uh, based on self-defense doesn't mean that self-defense is not an option. It just means that at that preliminary stage of the case, it wasn't appropriate for the judge to just completely dispense with the entire uh, reality of a trial. So that ruling in and of itself, I mean, it just means it's unclear, but it doesn't mean that it's, you know, that it's absolutely not a possibility. So I think any time you have a case where uh, a shooting or, you know, a, a stabbing, a death was the was the result of some kind of fight between people. It makes sense to raise that self-defense argument because, you know, there's a lot of facts to sort out about what really happened. So I think we need to know more to know how credible that is in this case. Um, but I, I think just because the judge ruled against it initially as a preliminary matter doesn't mean that it couldn't be successful now. Right. Well, and what's what's clear in this case is this case is being tried as a manslaughter case, not even as a first degree uh, murder or a second degree murder. So already the prosecution is making an admission by not overcharging the case and charging it as a lesser uh, because they know that they have weaknesses in the case of he said, she said. And it is going to come down to whether or not the jury believes there is a viable self-defense argument or not in this case. Um, you know, we're going to have to go back into the courtroom to watch this trial to watch it develop in front of us and see whether or not it really is self-defense. But I think that will be a very hard argument to prove in light of the testimony and the conflicting stories. Nonetheless, we have a live feed in the courtroom and we're going to go back to court. Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz. We are doing a crime giveaway in conjunction with CrimeCon. It is a special giveaway. And there it is on the screen. You can win two tickets to come to our studio with a hotel stay. Meet our very own Dan Abrams in studio for our network and get a Creepy Crate subscription and a Kindle loaded with true crime books from the lineup. So enter to win on our website and stay tuned for details on who the winner is. Before the break, we were discussing the case out of Florida. It's a new trial that we started today. It's the Elder Demetrius case. And on the stand, we had Wendy Gambolis. She is the girlfriend of the victim of Knight. And during the break, uh, my guest, Elora, a long crime trial analyst, uh, and I were talking. And Laura, you had a couple choice words to say about the prosecution in this case. And both of us were pretty, you know, uh, it's always great to have real emotive um, testimony coming through with a witness that you know, shows real emotions that a jury can see and we can see. And, you know, this is the important part of a trial. This is the trier of fact. This is when we see the facts. We're not reading about it on paper in an appeals process. So, so what are your choice words and what is it that you wanted to say about the prosecution? I mean, this prosecutor is botching this case with her work with the witness, with the girlfriend witness. I, I don't understand what is going on. But obviously, this woman is not only incredibly important from an emotional standpoint, because she is sort of the closest person to the victim, but she's an eyewitness in the case. So she is, and, and we're talking about a case where we really need to know exactly what happened, because, uh, you know, there was a fight between these two people, or, or at least alleged fight, so we need to know what happened. Her testimony could not be more important. And the prosecutor... Is, is coming at her with such an attitude that what I am getting from the prosecutor's tone of voice, her choice of words, her questioning, 
is that she doesn't like or doesn't trust this witness. Well, that's a little crazy because it's their own witness. This is a prosecution's witness. So the prosecution yeah. would want to bolster her up and make her more credible because they're trying to prove in this he said, she said exactly. arena of, of who, who did what and who pulled the knife first and who even had the knife first. This is the prosecution's goal to make Wendy, the girlfriend, actually believable because Wendy's the one that's saying that the, that the defendant pulled the knife and that the defendant, you know, I did, you know, was the aggressor. And then the defendant is saying that Knight was the aggressor. But you see her tearfully, her tearful plea on the stand. And it's, it's hard, you know, it's hard as, a, as, as someone that watches that to think that um, her, her boyfriend, who's now deceased and passed the victim, would be the aggressor because she's so emotional over it. But nonetheless, we're going to continue to watch this very closely. The, the, they just went on a quick break. So we're going to go back to the other trial that we're watching out of Florida. This is the James Colley case. James Colley was found guilty for first-degree murder on two counts, among other charges, and this is a death penalty case. Right now we are in the second phase of the trial. It's now the death penalty trial, which is a mini trial to figure out whether or not now that he's found guilty that he is worthy of the death penalty. It is the same panel of jurors that decided his guilt, which will decide whether or not they're going to sentence him to get to death, and they only need one juror to hold out. We're going to go back into the courtroom to the sentencing phase of this trial and then come back for some more in-studio analysis. I'm Carissa Kranz, and that was prosecution's opening statement for the Demetrius Elder case out of Florida. This is a case where it's a he said, she said trial on whether or not the defendant is going to be found guilty of a manslaughter charge, not even, not a murder charge, not first degree or second degree. This case is not overcharged. Uh, you just heard in opening statements the prosecution was discussing aggravating and mitigating factors and saying in their opening statement that as you hear what these aggravating factors Factors are, you'll have no choice but to return a verdict of guilty. That's what we just heard. With me is law and crime trial analyst um, Elora Nanos. Elora, you know, we, I'm listening to this and I'm, I'm hearing clear strategy on how to get a guilty verdict. I mean, this is not an overcharged case. It's clear that he died, and it's clear that he died at the hands of someone else, and it's clear that he died of knife wounds. What's not clear is who's the aggressor, motive, and whether or not self-defense could be a winning argument. What do you make of these varying factors? Well, I think that, that uh, kind of deconstructing a fight between two people that ended in a death is always a difficult case. Um, you know, barring having been directly there, it, it's really difficult to, in retrospect, recreate what exactly happened. And, um, you know, and what we're hearing is this plan to say, look, um, this, is, this is admittedly a difficult thing, but we, that's why he was charged with manslaughter. That's right. why he wasn't charged with murder. Right. Um, so, and this is really going to depend on the jury understanding the difference. Okay, I'm going to have to jump in because we have to go to a quick break, but I agree with you that it is going to come down to mitigation and aggravating factors. But stay with us, and after this break, we're going to go back into the courtroom and have more in-studio analysis. That was defense opening statements for the penalty phase in the Cauley trial. This is the death penalty case. This case is all about aggravating and mitigating factors. We heard it from both the prosecution in the opening statements and the defense in the opening statements. The prosecution's goal is to lay out all the aggravating, all the aggravating factors to sentence him to death. And the defense's goal is to lay out all the mitigating factors to sentence him to death. We're going to have a brief discussion about this, but one thing that's important to understand in a death penalty trial, which is a sentencing phase of the case, is that the rules of evidence are relaxed, which means there are victim impact statements, hearsay can be admissible, the jury gets to hear things that the jury would not normally hear during the actual trial of finding guilt. So sometimes other aspects of the case come out in the, sentence, in the sentencing trial in order for the jury to have a more complete picture of the person that they convicted and what is an appropriate sentence. Should he be behind bars the rest of his life or should we sentence him to death? And some jurors may even have a moral problem with the death penalty, which 
is why some states are death penalty states and others are not. Without further ado, let's discuss this topic with Elora Nanos, Law and Crime Trial Analyst. So, Laura, we just listened to the opening statements from both. Obviously, we're going to hear aggravating and mitigating factors. What, if you were to predict, what would you say your prediction is going to be on this case? Is he going to get sentenced to death? You know, we're I, live, so we don't have answers. It's not like we're withholding the answer right now. Right. I, if I had to guess, I would say, yes, he's going to get the death penalty. And here's why. When you have a, a, uh, a defendant who has been convicted of a horrific crime, the, the, the circumstances of the crime are very, very sad. And so far, I have not heard anything about this defendant that makes me sympathetic toward him. He is a habitual a perpetrator of domestic violence. And that, in particular, to me, is the critical factor in why a jury might convict him and, and sentence him to death. And I think that even people who um, don't really like the death penalty, people who aren't really thrilled with the entire idea of the death penalty, those people are often swayed by crimes that are uh, sort of go part and parcel with domestic violence. Right. Um, because well, I think the logic is keep him away from society forever with no chance. Right. Well, there's a lot of policy arguments for the death penalty for and against either way. You know, some people believe an eye for an eye, you killed one or two people, so therefore you should die. And other people say, you know what, you should rot in prison and think about what you did and not cost the state or the federal government more money sitting behind bars on appeals because unfortunately these death penalty trials they drag out forever and even if the jury does sentence him to death there's going to be a lengthy appeals process which is going to cost even more money um, you know and another thing you brought up that I thought was interesting is the the victims side of this um, there's a lot of mitigating factors that the defense is going to bring up and when we heard the defense's opening statement they were making him the victim. He's the victim of domestic violence. He's the victim of prescription drugs. He's the victim of depression. And therefore, you shouldn't make him a victim of the death penalty. Do you feel like that's an effective argument? We have to go to a quick break, so try to answer that as quickly as possible. Sure. I think it can be effective. I don't think it's going to be effective here because of the issue of domestic violence, because this guy is a, is a habitual offender. I just don't think it's going to work, and I don't think things like drugs are going to help make this guy look like a victim. I just don't think it's going to work here. I, okay, so we'll see. We're going to next, after this break, go to the victim impact statements. And this is uh, actually the victims giving their own emotional testimony. Depending on how powerful that plea is to the jury, we'll see what happens next. So stay tuned and stick with us. Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz. We are watching closely the James Cawley trial out of Florida. We're now in the sentencing phase. We're going to pick up where we left off. But right before we do that, we're going to take a look at other top crime stories trending around the country by our very own Anthony Velez. Here are today's top crime stories trending on lawandcrime.com and across the country. Police in New York City are asking the public for help in identifying this man who reportedly punched an 81-year-old man in a random attack. The attack occurred in the Melrose section of the Bronx at 11 p.m. Authorities believe there was no interaction between the victim and his attacker prior to the altercation. The victim was taken to Lincoln Hospital and is expected to be okay. The deadly shooting and hostage situation at Trader Joe's in Los Angeles this weekend was reportedly the result of a feud between the suspect and his grandmother. 28-year-old Gene Even Atkins was arrested after he allegedly fatally shot Trader Joe's employee, 27-year-old Melida Corrado, during a gunfight with police. Atkins reportedly was arguing with his 76-year-old grandmother when he shot her, setting off the police chase, which ended with Atkins taking hostages at the Trader Joe's. Atkins was booked on one count of murder and is being held on $2 million bond. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for Law and Crime. Thank you, Anthony. And wow, what a sad story. A grandmother as the target, which turns into a chaotic shooting with an employee at Trader Joe's being shot and killed and, and, and dead with a whole lot of other victims caught in the line of fire. Um, a crazy case with me, Elora Nanos, law and crime trial analyst. Before we go back to the sentencing phase, Akali, I want to discuss this case with you real fast. You know, so he didn't intend to kill that worker at Trader Joe's, but he could still be found guilty of an intense type murder because under the felony murder rules. Isn't that correct? 
That's exactly right. And and uh, under the law in most states, uh, we have the felony murder rule, which says that if you're in the middle of committing a violent felony and someone dies, if it, even if you weren't intentionally trying to kill that person, uh, the death can be blamed on the felon because he's in the middle of committing another crime. Um, and it's a way of sort of getting justice for victims exactly like this woman who was, you know, a, sort of a, a bystander type victim, had nothing to do with the defendant, um, but was sadly killed in the middle of him committing another crime. Um, so, I mean, this is this is not going to go well for this guy. No, and it's really sad to just see these cases where somebody, you know, had a rather normal life, seemingly, and then just had a couple weeks of withdrawing. And, uh, you know, the grandmother was talking about how he was a little cold and removed, and then he just snapped. You know, and you never know what's going to cause someone to snap like that where lives are at stake and um, evil can approach any day, which we were hearing earlier today when we were listening to the sentencing phase of the Cauley case on how these victims' lives have been changed forever because they no longer can count on seeing. Nothing is guaranteed. No one is guaranteed. No future date is guaranteed. You know, you, you believe that... Tomorrow you're going to get up, have your cup of coffee, go to work, and that everything's going to be business as usual. And then there are these tragedies where life takes another turn and it makes us all sit back and have to digest the change and difference in circumstances. Um, in this case, it's a case we'll probably continue to follow here on Law and Crime, um, but it's one that we're definitely covering today as it is a trending legal story and crime story around the country. But right now we're going to go back into the Kali sentencing phase, and here we're going to listen to the victim impact statements, which means we're going to be listening to the victims say whether or not they want um, – and it's, it's not just the victims, but it's the victims' family members for both sides – what do they want, and why do they have the argument that they have? Remember, this is the sentencing phase, which means hearsay is admissible. It is a relaxed rule of evidence. And we're going to now hear how their lives have changed as a result of the defendant's actions that day. That is such sad testimony. That's the victim impact statements in the James Cauley case, which means the family members of the victims are now giving testimony for the prosecution um, in this death penalty trial, the second phase of this case, to try to discuss and try to, uh, you know, put aggravating factors on the jurors in order to sentence him to death. As you can hear there, she's talking about how her life is forever changed, how um, her you know, the, a life was stolen from her too prematurely. With me, Elora Nanos, long crime uh, trial analyst. How do you think this is going so far? I mean, when you see someone break down on the stand, it's not, it's very easy to stop being so legal and technical um, and become real in those moments when you see such realness uh, exuded on the stand of an emotional breakdown. Yeah, this is really hard to watch. Uh, it's not just that the witness is breaking down. It's not just that she's the sister of the victim or that she's wearing the ribbon to show awareness of domestic violence. She's, uh, you know, giving life to the words of these children that have been left behind. And I, I really don't think that there is really anything that could be more sad than that. Hearing what children have to say about losing their mother violently, it is the saddest thing ever. And, and Particularly what stuck with me is the victim's daughter saying that, uh, I think it was the daughter, saying that, that what she remembers is that whenever daddy was mean, mom would hold us and love on us and keep us safe. And I don't know that anything could be more compelling than that. And I think that even people that maybe, um, you know, didn't go into this, uh, you know, looking to, to vote for the death penalty, really may be swayed by that because it's so heartbreaking. And you know what's really sad, I just want to piggyback on what you just said, is, you know, this is a case where whether or not he gets the death penalty, these kids lost both parents. These kids lost their mother at the hands of their father, and these kids will never be raised by their father because of what he did. So this is truly going to come down to whether or not the jurors believe that the death penalty is a fair 
sentence and whether or not they even morally agree with it. It's a, you know, a lot of people. Do you, do you agree with the death penalty personally? Do you have issues with it? I, I have a lot of issues with the death penalty. And, and I'll tell you the one um, that I what bring up. What state are you out of? I, I'm, I, so I live in New Jersey and I practice in both New York and New Jersey. Um, so these are not these are not states where the death penalty really okay, comes. So I, I'm actually from Florida, which is a death penalty state. And there's actually a really interesting technicality that's happening right now. Um, we're going to have to go to a break in 30 seconds. So maybe we're going to we can talk about it when we get back from the break. But um, in Florida, you have to have a unanimous verdict in order to sentence to death, which it didn't always have to be that way. So there are a lot of trials and, and, and defendants on death row right now that didn't have a unanimous jury verdict for the death penalty, and all of those now are um, compromised uh, verdicts and on appeal. Very costly process. We have to go to a quick break, but please stick with us and we'll continue our in-studio analysis. Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz. Before the break, we had to cut it short. We were in the middle of a discussion on the death penalty with our long crime trial analyst, Elora Nanos. Um, Elora, I, you know, I was discussing this and we, we got cut off because we had to go to that commercial break and um, it was too bad because I think we were both in a policy discussion. You're not in the death penalty states. I'm from a death penalty state in Florida where this case is out of and they require a unanimous uh, jury verdict in order to sentence to death, but it didn't always used to be that way. It used to be a recommendation and it didn't have to be unanimous and a defendant could still be sentenced to death. Right now, there are a lot of defendants on death row appealing because they didn't have a unanimous jury verdict and now there's questions on whether or not their sentence to death is a, is a valid sentence to death or unconstitutional. So you and I were just talking about, on, more on a policy basis, whether or not we believed in the death penalty and what our, our, what our position was. And you were about to say something, and then you got cut off and we went to break. So all yours. So, you know, I, I get involved in death penalty debates all the time. And I, I absolutely understand that people from a moral point of view have, you know, totally differing opinions that really can't quite be reconciled. But one of the things that always sticks out to me as, a, as an attorney and as a former prosecutor is that one of the things that is unfair about the death penalty is that uh, death penalty cases require the work not only of jurors, but they, it requires the work of prosecutors, defense lawyers, judges, and the amount of stress that, the, that death penalty cases put on individuals in the legal system is really, really profound. And if you can imagine, uh, if you are a judge or if you are a prosecutor who is morally opposed to the death penalty, but working in a death penalty state, you might have an active hand in having to put someone to death. And that is so unfair for someone who doesn't believe in that. And the other thing that yeah. always strikes me about the death penalty is that there have been studies done that show that oftentimes uh, jurors in death penalty cases will choose to acquit someone they know to be guilty so that they avoid the death penalty. Right, yeah. Uh, and that's terrible. Uh, you know, and, and there's something to be said about playing God in these situations, and that's really what the justice system asks us to do with the death penalty um, sentence. So even if you believe someone's guilty and that, you know, they don't deserve to be here anymore, that's different than saying, I'm going to be the one to sentence them to death, and now this person's going to die at my hands because yeah. someone else died at their hands. And, you know, I have to say, if I was a juror <laughs> and I'm a former prosecutor, I'd have a problem with that. I, you know, first, and, and forget about the moral problem, the cost, the cost of money that it costs our system to, to, to fight these death penalty trials and appeals and to, um, is more than just housing them and putting them away for the rest of their life, and sort of letting the laws of karma deal with it. But, exactly. you know, the law is the law, and when you are instructed to follow the law, you take an oath and you're supposed to do just that. But as you said, we see it all the time, jurors will actually acquit a guilty person because they don't want the blood on their hands of, of yeah. being responsible that's, that's for someone problem. else's death. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a result from something, and it's an unintended result. And and I think that uh, it, it is, you know, thing, the death penalty shines a light on, on a problem in criminal justice in general, but it's just sort of an extreme version of that. But all of the people involved have these incredible moral burdens put on them in many criminal cases. And I think it's important that we continue to be aware of that. 
Okay, so we're going to continue to be aware of that as we continue to follow this death penalty case. We're in the sentencing phase of the uh, James Cauley case. It's a death penalty trial. He was found guilty on all counts. And now the same jury is going to decide whether or not he should be sentenced to death. We are listening to victim impact statements. And the next statement we're going to listen to is William Mosler. This is Lindy Dobbins' father. So Lindy Dobbins was one of the victims with Amanda Cauley. James Cauley killed Amanda Cauley, his estranged wife, and her best friend, Lindy Dobbins. So this is now the father of Lindy Dobbins. Let's take a look. Please. Welcome back. We are discussing the sentencing phase, and that's the victim impact statements. That's William Mosler, Lindy Dobbins' father. Um, we're going to discuss this now with our law and crime trial analyst, Elora Nanos. Elora, you and I were messaging back and forth during um, that testimony, and I think we're on the same page here. This death penalty, this death penalty thing, neither one of us really thinks that this is the way to go, but as you said, he should just uh, burn in hell, and I think he should sit and rot in jail and think about it rather than us decide that we should uh, play God or jurors should decide to take his life. But anyway, what do, you, what do you make of everything so far? How's it going? I think it's going terribly for him. Um, I, I mean, I, and I think he will get the death penalty because this strikes me as one of those cases um, where if anyone deserves the death penalty, he does. I mean, Barring, you know, maybe a child victim. But does he maybe? I mean, listen to the mitigating factors. We're listening to how, you know, the, the defense attorney saying he was under the influence of Ambien. I mean, if you know anyone who's taken Ambien, they really do have blackouts. They really do have lapses in memories. They aren't always themselves. It does mentally alter the brain. That's one mitigating factor. Another mitigating factor is the fact that he it was clinically depressed and that he was abused as a child and he witnessed domestic violence his whole life. Does he really deserve the death penalty? He obviously is guilty of these crimes and there's no excuse. But is it really up to us? I mean, it is. It's up to the jurors. But is it really up to us to decide that he doesn't deserve to live as well? Is that us as hu in, in, in human form? Is that something we should be deciding? I mean, I'll tell you that I don't believe it's something that we should be deciding. But my own beliefs aside, the jury is tasked with deciding this. And, um, and yeah, they're and I'm, charged with deciding this. This is this is what they they, they have an obligation to decide yeah, they this. To decide. They took and, an and, oath to right, have and to. I actually think it's terribly unfair to put that on a juror, a jury, or anyone else. But that's you know that's what we're dealing with. And, and I, I hear what you're saying, Carissa, about those mitigating factors. Um, sure, I understand that in many cases, things like drugs and um, past trauma, that those things do act as mitigating factors. But none of them really, to me, seem compelling enough to negate the, the aggravating factors. Okay, so it's not compelling enough to you to negate the aggravating elements. But by the same token, you don't want to sentence someone to death either. So if you were a juror on that panel right now, even though you're sitting here as a former prosecutor and you could make your case, you could easily make your case and say, this, the, one of these aggravating factors are enough. This man deserves to die, and we know he did it. The only issue was his state of mind at the time he did it, but the, he took other lives, and therefore he should go. But if you were the juror, which is different than being the prosecutor, switch roles, change hats, if you were the juror, what would you say? What would your decision be? Yes or no to the death penalty? I, I think that's really difficult because well, here's yes the thing. or no. Which one? If I were a juror, I think I would have said the no before I got on the jury because the judge usually asks during voir dire if the jurors. Of course, the judge asks. We're going to have to go to a break. We're getting counted <laughs> down, but let's continue to talk about this when we get back because it is an interesting topic to discuss. Stay with us. Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz. Before the break, we were discussing the death penalty phase of the James Cauley case, and we were getting into a pretty heated discussion with our law and crime trial analyst, Laura, uh, Laura Nanos. Um, we were discussing the aggravating and mitigating factors. As the audience and the viewers and everyone here knows, he was found guilty on all counts for murdering his estranged wife and her best friend, and then there were other victims in the house who were witnesses who fled and escaped, plus the burglary charges. Because this is out of Florida, this is a death penalty case. We're in the second phase of the trial, which is another mini trial with relaxed evidence of victim impact statements and hearsay and all sorts of aggravating and mitigating facts coming into evidence. And before the break, you and I were discussing those aggravating and mitigating factors in a very lawyerly way. We were wearing our lawyer hats as former prosecutor, but then we switched and we wore our very human hats about whether or not we agree 
agree with the death penalty and how that would resonate to us if we were a juror. And I asked you the question before the break, what would your vote be? And you answered it in a very diplomatic way by saying, well, that's a very difficult question as a preface. And then I stopped you and I said, well, what's your answer? And we didn't really get your answer yet. Um, you know, and you've said as a prosecutor, you could argue this easily about the aggravating factors. But then as on a personal level, you don't necessarily agree with the death penalty. So now I'm going to ask you the $100 million question in this case. So here it is. If you were a juror on that panel and you were wearing the hat of a jury, not of a prosecutor, not of a defense attorney, how would you vote? So if I were a juror and I would follow the law, and that means that at the if at the end of this sentencing phase, um, if I really felt that the aggravating factors outweighed the mitigating ones, I would vote for the death penalty because that would be my responsibility as a juror. Now we're not at the end of the of that phase yet, so I haven't heard all the evidence. Um, but I'll tell you that, for, you know, from what I'm hearing now, I do think the aggravating factors do outweigh the mitigating factors. Um, having said that, I would hope never to be in that that position, because if I were a juror, I would hope that during the voir dire process, I would have the opportunity to say, I really feel uncomfortable voting for the death penalty, and, you know, please ask the judge that I wouldn't have to sit on such a case. Um, but, but if I were in the position to have to sit on that jury, I would absolutely follow the law. I think that's what these jurors will do, and that's why but I really... But they did follow the law. They came up with a, a verdict of guilty, yeah. and now right. it's whether or not the aggravating and the mitigating factors are enough to follow through with the sentencing phase. Nonetheless, this, this is a never-ending discussion, and it's fun to talk about, but there's a reason some states are death penalty states and others are not. It, it's not a question we're going to resolve today, and it's, it's certainly leaving us all hanging on what the jury's actually going to do. We have to go back into the courtroom. As you can see on the screen, we have new witnesses on the stand. This is in the James Cauley sentencing phase. And we have Michelle Quiraga. She's a neuropsychologist. So let's listen in and see what she has to say that's either aggravating or mitigating. Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz. We were just listening to cross-examination of the victim's girlfriend, Wendy Gambolis, and she was... Losing some credibility there on the stand. At the top of the screen where you see uh, James Cauley sentencing hearing, and at the bottom of the screen you see the Elder, Demetrius Elder case, both cases out of Florida. The top one is the death penalty case that we've been following really closely for the last uh, more than a week. Uh, James Cauley was found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder and burglary, among other charges. And now the jury is in the sentencing phase. It's another mini trial where we're listening to victim impact statements and experts for aggravating and mitigating factors to decide whether or not the death penalty is a sentence that the jury will ultimately decide whether or not to recommend. It must be unanimous. The second trial at the bottom is the Demetrius Elder case. It's out of Florida 2014 case. We've been watching a lot of uh, circus tricks in that courtroom today. Um, almost even had a plea deal, but then it didn't happen. We had to go on a break bef uh, you know, while the courtroom went on a break to discuss the plea deal out of the presence of the jury. Um, with me, Elora Nanos, long crime trial analyst. Um, Laura, you know, what do you, we've been, a lot's going on today, all out of Florida. What do you make of what, of this cross-examination? Is she losing credibility? Uh, I mean, I guess this is such a weird cross-examination. Uh, you see the attorney, uh, impeaching the witness, meaning, uh, you know, trying to discredit the witness, but picking the most random possible point to do it on. The, we, we have the attorney, the defense attorney, trying to impeach the, the victim's girlfriend with, I guess, a, a prior statement where she said she was just his friend and now she's saying she's his girlfriend. This to me seems like an idiotic point to press her on. And the attorney who did that cross-examination did it completely wrong. Tried to use what's called refreshing recollection, which does not fit what was happening during that testimony and did it all wrong. So I am totally confused about 
this type of cross-examination, I don't get what the point is, and I don't get why the attorneys are doing it wrong. Well, and sometimes the point is is to do exactly what you just said to confuse. Um, it's cross-examination, and the defense lots of times will do anything and everything to, to confuse the focus of the jurors so they don't get the guilty verdict. And if you're confused and trying to even dissect and analyze it a little bit and not understanding why, then that's clutter for the jury. And the jury is going to have a harder time parsing out exactly what the bombshell piece of evidence is. But we're going to go back into the courtroom and listen in and see if we get that bombshell piece of evidence. Gathering. 